Love, joy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is the first lesson from Acts chapter 3. Peter and John had just healed a man crippled from birth. He was begging and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus I say to you, walk. And and he walked for the first time in his life and the Bible says that he went walking and leaping and praising God. And, And so that's where we come to this reading. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That's the text. So do you guys remember the uh, Verizon wireless guy some years ago who went all over the world convincing us that Verizon had coverage everywhere? Remember? Can you hear me now? Good. Can you hear me now? How do you build America's Good. largest wireless network? Can you hear me now? Good. By never being satisfied. Can you hear me now? Good. Until no matter where you go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Your call goes through. Can you hear me now? Good. Verizon Wireless. We never stop working for you. How long ago do you think that those commercials ran? Five years? Uh, good, good guess, yeah. Uh, actor uh, Paul Marcarelli appeared in those commercials from 2002 all the way to 2010. That is a long ad campaign. I think he did a reprise in 2011 also. No wonder that catchphrase lingers in our vocabulary. Can you hear me now? And he always managed to be very earnest and sincere in asking that question over and over again down through the years. But did you ever wonder what it might have been like for the guy on the other side of the phone? And it goes rapidly downhill from there. We didn't need to see the rest of it. But it does serve to illustrate the fact that just because you can hear somebody doesn't mean that you want to. We are in a unique place and time in our culture where many people are talking in many different ways, face-to-face and Facebook, texting, podcasts, comments on posts, and you know, with all kinds of ways we are talking to each other with all kinds of opinions. 
It really seems as if people are more ready than ever before to get upset at what somebody else has to say. It doesn't take listening to somebody all day long to get people to blow their top. It might take only one little comment, especially if that comment is in any way judging the behavior of somebody else. In fact, I would say that judgmentalism has truly become the unforgivable sin in our politically correct culture today. There's a series bubbling up for me. It'll, it'll come out sometime, maybe summer or end of summer. What do you say when? And, you know, uh, there's a lot of those things. Like, uh, what do you say when people accuse Christians of being too judgmental or homophobic or this or that or the other thing? And we'll address a lot of those. But we are all slowly becoming aware of this, this attack against judgmentalism. And we very much don't want to be accused of being judgmental because of the angry repercussions that follow. Which is why this, this section in Acts, is, it comes off sounding really strange to people in our day. I mean, you will never hear more direct law or sweeter gospel than Peter doles out in this impromptu sermon. The law is obvious. Peter has just healed a man crippled from birth in the name of Jesus. And when people heard about it, the Bible says all the people were astonished and they came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colony, the outside part of the temple with big pillars all around. They wanted to know what was going on. And so Peter used this opportunity to give this very short sermon to start preaching. And folks, talk about a guy who's come a long way. From the guy in the courtyard where Jesus was on trial before Caiaphas, three times denying he even knew who Jesus was, and later hiding behind closed doors for fear that the Jews would take him too and crucify him like his master. Folks, this is night and day. This is the power of the Holy Spirit who came on the disciples ten days after the ascension and enabled them to speak boldly. The Bible says God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. I guess so. Take a look again at what Peter says to the Jews and their leaders in the middle of their temple stronghold. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. <clears throat> Folks, when you are trying to engage in reasonable dialogue, say with your spouse, I've shared this with you guys, probably all of you at, at some point in time, particularly if you're having difficulty with rational, good-spirited discussion in your marriage. The word you is probably one that you might want to avoid. You never take out the trash. You never treat me with respect. You, you, you. And, <laughs> right? You is a kind of a confrontational word. It's better sometimes when you're trying to reach out to focus on me. I feel frustrated when the trash overflows and there's cockroaches and things. What can, what can we do to help me with this? You know, it's, a bad, it's an invitation to help. It's not an attack, right? There's different ways to communicate. But look at how, you know, Paul or Peter, he doesn't care in this regard. He is confrontational and he means to be confrontational. Look at him pop out. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One. You killed the author of life. Wow. Peter obviously wants his crowd to feel the full weight and responsibility of what they've done. Talk about courage. Folks, this is only a couple of months after these very people had taken their leader, their rabbi, and put him on the cross for saying stuff like this. 
You think these folks would have appreciated hearing this kind of sermon in their own temple? You killed the author of life? I don't think so. They would absolutely have closed their ears to this. In fact, we find out after this text that Peter and John were thrown into prison for the things that they were saying. Simple fact is that when you tell people what they need to hear but don't want to hear, they don't always appreciate the telling. In fact, when Stephen delivered a similar sermon to a crowd of uh, Jews, the Bible says that this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. Have your kids ever done this? Na 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 That's what they did. They acted like little kids. And they rushed at them, at, at Stephen, and began to stone him. And he became the first Christian martyr. Folks, we are not at that level where you will get stoned in our culture for speaking the truth in the name of Jesus, but we are experiencing similar things on any number of social issues where people do not want to hear what God in his word has to say. For instance, until recently, any pro-life politician was said to be engaged in a war against women. Now, somehow, if you are for protecting human beings in the womb, that makes you against women. Now, that doesn't make sense, but that has been the narrative. <clears throat> Please trust me on this. When I branch off into politics, I understand I'm on dangerous ground. Okay? I don't want to offend people unnecessarily. I don't want a church of all Republicans or all Democrats or all independents. I want a church full of people who believe in Jesus Christ and who are faithful to his word. Okay? But an interesting thing happened among presidential candidates recently. Uh, Rand Paul, and, and I understand most of you probably aren't even following this. Really? There's presidential candidates already? Yeah, there's people who have announced we're going to have be treated to this for a year and a half of campaigning. We're going to have to endure. But I will be interested to see if presidential candidate Rand Paul has succeeded in changing, at least subtly, that narrative of if you are for life, you're against women. Let's take a look at what he said. You know, I guess the, here's the question. You know, we always seem to have the debate way over here on what are the exact details of exceptions or when it starts. Why don't we ask the DNC, is it okay to kill a seven pound baby in the uterus? You go back and you ask Debbie Wasserman Schultz if she's okay with killing a seven pound baby that is just not yet born yet. Ask her when life begins and you ask Debbie when she's willing to protect life. When you get an answer from Debbie, come back to me. Again, I'm not presidential politicking here. I'm not for him or anyone else in that race. But I think he did something different there. And people, many people have expressed that they're thinking about life a little bit differently since then. The answer, of course, came back from Debbie. That she does not want any protection for unborn infants right up until the time of birth. And when you hear that, it just, it does, it changes. It allows some Americans to rethink that issue. Somehow a civilized society has to provide for the life and the protection of all its citizens, from the largest to the smallest. This is not an abortion sermon. It's not about politics. It's about hearing what we need to hear. It's about Christians also being able to say to a world that is literally dying to hear it, the Word of God. It's about being biblically correct, certainly, more than being politically correct. 
And are there consequences of speaking truth to a culture that in many ways doesn't want to hear it? Absolutely, there are consequences. So why put yourself through it? Why be bold? Why speak things that people don't want to hear? Well, a number of reasons which we had better learn if we're going to be effective witnesses for Christ in a day that is becoming similar to Peter and John's when people also tried to keep Jesus dead and buried. I would say in no particular order, because we know heaven is our true home. And because we know that Christ rose, because he, know, he rose, we too will rise. And folks, when you live life from that eternal perspective, you slowly start to realize that what happens to you in this life is not all that important because it's fleeting, it's temporary, and it's not worth comparing with the glory that will be one day revealed to us and in us. What happens to you is far less important than what, ha than what happens in you. Again, why speak the truth in love? Because the eternal destiny of the people we are talking to is at stake. By the way, please... Ah, sorry, I didn't put it in there. I asked the question. Why speak the truth in love? Right? You understand that's a given. That we ought not to speak the truth harshly, but with gentleness and respect. That's not always being done by Christians. Why speak the truth in love? Because the eternal destiny of the people we are speaking to is at stake. And folks, what is a socially awkward moment in comparison with that? The book of Hebrews, and particularly the 10th chapter of Hebrews, has some of the sweetest gospel truth in the whole Bible, but it also has some of the most frightening law. The author says in chapter 10, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy and the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Well, what were the Jewish leaders at that time trying to do if not that, trying to sell the lie that Jesus had not really risen from the dead, trying to cover it all up, literally. But do you think it would, be, would have been doing them a favor to just ignore that behavior, to ignore their denial of Christ crucified and risen? Not at all. Nothing is to be gained by pretending I'm okay, you're okay, when we're not okay. Fact is that all of us are poor, miserable sinners. There is not a single person in this sanctuary to whom Peter could not have delivered this little sermon. All of us have disowned the holy and righteous one. Every time we knew the right and chose the wrong, we did just that. Every time we had the opportunity to speak and live for Christ, and instead we pretended we were in the secret service of God's army. By the way, we don't have that branch. Folks, again, it was because of your sin, the rottenness in your life and mine, that Jesus was nailed to that cross. That's the truth. And if we are to represent Jesus the way, the truth, and the life, then we need to be about the truth with a capital T. Not someone's construction of their own personal truth as they perceive it. See, in this politically correct world, <clears throat> it may be barely possible to not give offense, to avoid giving offense on certain things. I do believe it's worth the effort. Once again, to speak with gentleness and respect, that's how God has asked us to speak to people, even to speak the truth. But you need to realize that in the end, Jesus Christ and him crucified for us, for all people, is the greatest offense that's out there for people. The fact that Jesus is the way to God. 
There is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the greatest offense. It is the most politically incorrect thing that you can say today. But it's the thing that we must say to people. And so if we're going to be true to being disciples of Christ who disciple others, in the end, it will be offensive in our world today. Again, why do we risk speaking the truth in love? Because we know heaven is our true home. And because Christ rose, we too will rise. Because the eternal destiny of the people we're talking to is at stake. And finally, because if people don't understand what their sin has really done and how it has separated them from God, they will never live a truly fulfilling life. That's what I like so much about the Truth Project from Focus on the Family. We still have that 12-week DVD study. If you want to take a group through it or take your family through it, we can give you those resources. That study is about giving people the truth and an accurate worldview. Folks, without a biblical worldview, if you think about it, people really are, uh, are condemned to live outside of reality. They live outside the truth, and therefore they're bound to become confused about life. For instance, if you don't understand that there was a real Garden of Eden and a real Adam and Eve who really disobeyed God and ate from the tree they were commanded not to eat from and brought sin, death, and suffering into the world, then when sin, death, and suffering hits you, when you have someone in your life who is, who is sick and suffering and you don't like to see that or, or, or injustice is happening in the world and, and you still believe there's a God out there, then you'll blame him and you'll be mad at him for the things that you see that are happening. But folks, blaming God will never bring peace to your life and it will never allow you to deal with the real problem of the sin in your life and in the people around you. The only way to deal with that is to be biblically correct, not politically correct. Be honest with yourself and admit where you've blown it and gone wrong. And that's where we see the, the beauty of Peter's short sermon here. It's not truly about blaming and shaming and attacking. It's about giving his audience an opportunity to face reality. Folks, this sermon is a model for all good preaching. It has the two key components of a good sermon, law and gospel. Law and gospel are the handles of the Bible. When you use them appropriately, you can truly understand God's Word. If you don't learn to use them, you may learn a lot of stuff, a lot of information, but you won't be able to put it together, and you'll be ineffective in speaking to our world. That's why I really hope a lot of my sermons sound alike. I don't hope they sound boring, but I do hope there's some similarity there because all of them should contain both law and gospel because Christians can never get beyond the need for those truths. Martin Luther put it this way. Now these are the two works of God that are frequently commended in Scripture. He kills and makes alive. He wounds and heals. He destroys and builds up. He condemns and pardons. He brings low and lifts up. He rebukes and brings to honor these works he performs through two ministries. The first by the letter, that is the law. The second by the spirit, that is the gospel. The effect of the letter is such that because of his wrath, no one can continue to exist. That of the spirit is such that because of his grace, no one can perish. Ah, this matter is so preciously profound that it deserves to be spoken of constantly. And it does. This is exactly the way Peter preached his sermon. He truly condemned with the law. But listen to the precious gospel he also shares. Now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. This is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Folks, I've received those times of refreshing when I've come clean before my God, repented, turned away from my sin and turned back to Him. I've experienced you receive those same times of refreshing when you've done the same. Folks, that's why Jesus came. To wipe out your sins before God. To give you that refreshing life. Nothing can compare to the peace that forgiveness of sins can bring to your life. Times of refreshing. We need to take off those WIFM headphones, right? What's in it for me? Say no to our past, say yes to the future that God has for us, believing Jesus Christ crucified, dead, buried, and risen. 
you and I both need to be reminded that God not only wants refreshing and forgiveness for you, He wants that for every one of the people He has placed in your life. And may He give us the courage to speak up and be part of that process. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, the world in which we live often doesn't want to hear the truth of your word, but it needs to, and you have called us to that task. Forgive us for the times we've stayed silent and missed our opportunities to speak for you. Forgive us for the times also when we truly have been judgmental, that we've come across as mean-spirited to people instead of been winsome and inviting. Lord, strengthen our weak knees. Give us the courage to truly live like children who represent our Father. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes our ability even to understand it, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.